So here we are in Boise, Idaho. It's uh, just the most beautiful day today. This is the Capitol Grounds. I've been invited to speak right here on the Capitol Grounds. And take you all around downtown. A little bright over there. I hope it's not too bright. It's a beautiful day here in Boise. There's a statue across the way on the Capitol Grounds. Downtown Boise. And I hope you enjoy it. Here's a copy of the Liberty Bell. Lord bless you all. Hi, I'm Charlie Garrett. I'm a minister from Sarasota, Florida, and I'm traveling to all of the 50 state capitals in order to preach about Jesus Christ, about our nation's heritage, the Christian heritage which we have in America, what our founding fathers said about it, and also to uh, get people, challenge them to read their Bibles. So today I'm standing at the capital of Idaho, which is Boise, Idaho. It's a beautiful capital building. The people are incredibly nice. They said that this is the most conservative state in the entire union. The, we met the governor personally. I asked him for a one sentence statement on uh, what he thought about Idaho. He said it's the best state in the nation. And he also said that we have a balanced budget and all of our bills are paid. How great would it be if everybody, everybody else had that attitude? And uh, I'm a little out of breath. I've been running around here. But anyway, um, very nice people here. Everybody was exceptional. I asked if I could speak on the Capitol grounds. He said, speak right on the steps. I decided to be down one level so you can see the Capitol a little bit better. And uh, I'm going to start by reading a prayer for the state of Idaho, which I composed before coming here. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O oh, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. For you are the God of my strength. Why do you cast me off? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Oh, send your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle. Then I will go to the altar of God to God my exceeding joy. And on the harp I will praise you, O oh God, my God. Today I stand at the capital of Idaho, my 31st state to visit and the 43rd accepted into our union. Most glorious God, you who sent your son to dwell among us and show us the Father, I stand in this beautiful land, graced by your goodness, and pray for the leaders and people of this state. Send your fair and glorious spirit upon them and revive their souls. Ignite in them a burning desire to see you in the majesty of your splendor. Show them the way, the truth, and the life which is manifest in Jesus Christ our Lord. Give to them the living waters only he can provide, and may he be their good shepherd all their days. And the Lord and Lord, when that great day comes, be for them the resurrection and the life for all eternity. And by knowing you through him, may they ever proclaim, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. This is my petition and this is my prayer for the state of Idaho, the gem state, whose motto is Esto Perpetua. It is perpetual. All of this I pray in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, May he be perpetually glorified in the hearts and in the lives of this people. Amen. Next, I'd like to read to you the 85th Psalm. To the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Lord, you have been favorable to your land. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sin. Selah. You have taken away all your wrath. You have turned from the fierceness of your anger. Restore us, O God, of our salvation, and cause your anger towards us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what God, the Lord, will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway. Next, I'd like to read to you the preamble and section four of the Constitution of the State of Idaho. We, the people of the state of Idaho, grateful to Almighty God for our freedom to secure its blessings and promote our common welfare, do establish this Constitution. Before I read Section 4, I'd like to remind you that all 50 state constitutions mention God as the supreme ruler and creator of the universe in one way or another, 
and thereby acknowledge that God does exist and that we are obligated and bound to him. Section 4, guarantee of religious liberty. The exercise and enjoyment of religious faith and worship shall forever be granted, guaranteed, and no person shall be denied any civil or political right, privilege, or capacity on account of his religious opinions. But the liberty of conscience hereby secured shall not be construed to dispense with other, with oaths or affirmations, or excuse acts of licentiousness, or justify polygamous or other pernicious practices inconsistent with morality, or the peace or, sa of, or safety of the state, nor to permit any person, organization, or association to directly or indirectly aid, abet, counsel, or advise any person to commit the crime of bigamy or polygamy, or any other crime. No person shall be required to attend or support any ministry or place of worship, religious sect, or denomination, or pay tithes against his consent. Nor shall any preference be given by law to any religious denomination or mode of worship. Bigamy and polygamy are forever prohibited in this state, and the legislature shall provide by law for the punishment of such crimes. Next, I'd like to read to you several quotes by John Jay. He was the first uh, Supreme Court Justice of the United States Supreme Court. And he, on uh, religion, he wrote, whether our religion permits Christians to vote for infidel rulers is a question which merits more consideration than it seems yet ha to have generally received either from the clergy or the laity. It appears to me that what the prophet said to Jehoshaphat about his attachment to Ahab, and here he cites, uh, Jehu the son of Hanani the seer went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, shouldest thou help the wicked and love them who hate the Lord? Therefore there is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. This affords a salutary lesson. He's saying that we should not um, allow infidels or irreligious people to be elected to state or uh, federal government. And I think that is a great lesson for our current times in America. There's a lot of questions about um, some of the uh, religious affiliations of uh, some of our leaders without getting too direct. And uh, it's not something we should even question. People should avow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, as our founding fathers did, and stick to the moral principles of the Bible. On liberty, I recommend a general and public return of praise and thanksgiving to him from whose goodness these blessings descend. This is from Jesus Christ. The most effectual means of securing the continuance of our civil and religious liberties is always to remember with reverence and gratitude the source from which they flow, which is our God, our Creator, and Lord Jesus Christ. On natural law, the natural law was given by the sovereign of the universe to all mankind. On slavery, prior to the great revolution, the great majority of our people had been so long accustomed to the practice and convenience of having slaves that very few among them even doubted the propriety and rectitude of it. That men should pray and fight for their own freedom and yet keep others in slavery is certainly acting a very inconsistent as well as unjust and perhaps impious part. He was, back at the time of our founding fathers, was against slavery. He believed that it was something that should not be in the government. And um, uh, he spoke against it, as did most of our founding fathers. Now, before I get into today's talk on Romans 4, I'd like to remind you that Jesus Christ said that you must be born again in order to see the kingdom of heaven. There's no way around this. There's no saying, I'm a Christian, but I'm not born again. You must be born again. And this comes from John 3, verses 3 through 6, where he's speaking with Nicodemus. And he says, you must be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. This isn't some goofy doctrine, such as many churches hold, rolling around speaking in tongues and laughing and doing all kinds of crazy things that are not biblical. Being born again means being born from a divine source, from above. And that means that the Holy Spirit has come into you and it has changed you to live for God rather than for yourself and to turn and repent from sinning rather than to live in sin. This is being born again and it says the moment you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior that you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. If you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God the moment you believe, then you don't need to have a second baptism of the Holy Spirit. You don't need to speak in tongues or any other thing. So we need to make sure that we get our doctrine correct. Most of the book of Acts is descriptive, not prescriptive. That means it describes what happened. It doesn't prescribe what happens. Paul prescribes what happens in his epistles. So we do well to understand Pauline doctrine.